Obviously, I worked on a building site. I was getting up at six. It was hard graft. It's it not easy then going to training, midweek games, etc., etc. It was hard, and now I just think, right, I want to be known as not the builder, not the non-league footballer, I'm the Premier League goal scorer. Playing two in the Mitchum, I was in the sixth form at the time, and I was also working as a lifeguard, and now I'm being paid for a job that I'd love to do and I would do for free. Um, yeah, I didn't really see light at the end of the tunnel at the time, but um, I just got on with it really. Sometimes I think I do need to sit back and realise how far I've come in such a short space of time. In this era of megabucks television deals and extensive international scouting networks, the road from non-league to the summit of the domestic game is still pretty well trodden. From the much publicised Jamie Vardy to Arsenal new boy Cohen Brammel, almost all of those who have gone from non-league to the top have a rejection story. The rejection is as important as the journey itself. Through my juniors leagues, um, there were players that I thought I was better than them and they kept getting trials and I was like, how am I, how am I not getting these trials? And um, there was players that I went to school with, like the Craig Eastman, the Matthew Briggs. Craig Eastman was at Arsenal, Matthew Briggs was at Fulham. Went to school with them and I was like, I feel I'm as good as these guys. Why can't I get a trial? Um, but it just wasn't working out for me. But then, I, I, as, as someone said to me, what are you going to be? I go, I'm going to be a pro. I'm going to be pro, and I always believed in it. And the way I, I said it with a I was like, I'm going to be pro. But then I go, if I don't, I'm going to be a P teacher. <laughs> but I always go, I'm going to be pro. And I said it, I kept saying it, kept saying it, kept saying it. Then I got to 17, and I was like, oh, it could be a bit late. But I was like, you know what? If it happens, it happens. I'm going to keep pushing for it. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. And six games in, for two in the Mitchum, I signed for Reading. I was at Charlton from 9 to 15, like when they were giving the YTS um, scholarships out. So I was there quite a while. Um, I was too small at 15. I was, I was not the height I am now, I was, I was quite small. I didn't really grow to about 19. So, um, and it was the era of where you had to be big, strong, quick. Um, so it's come probably full circle now, and it was more the technical players. So, um, yeah, I was just too small at that age. Yeah, it's devastating. I've probably cried the whole way home. Um, Everyone's dreams is to play professional football. YTS is the next step on to becoming a professional footballer. Um, training every day and trying to get a new deal. So um, yeah, it was devastating. They got released by Charlton. I think it was in December. And then they had like a Premier League um, trials for all the, the kids that got released uh, in the summer. So everyone goes there, and then scouts will literally line up on the side of the pitch, and you'll get a letter a couple of weeks later of the club's interested in you. And I think mum was like Bristol City, Farnborough, and uh, and Stephen Hicks, yeah. Unwanted and unsigned, academy rejects and undiscovered stars have no choice but to turn to amateur football, hoping they can get their careers back on track. Moving into the muck and nettles of non-league is a challenge, but one that often proves to be the making of them, even if they don't appreciate the cold showers and roughhouse tactics at the time. The showers never were, although they were freezing cold, there was never hot showers in any away game, just cold showers hardly anything coming out. I remember my pre-match meal obviously now is obviously so professional. I'd have like a, a baguette, ham and cheese baguette from Tesco's garage. Like that was my food on the way to games. Like it's crazy like how much it turns around now because um, back then you'd just eat crap and, and deal with it but that's what I was used to. I remember a big centre half for Grays, Jamie Stewart, he was, he was a horrible, horrible guy and he'd elbowed one of our boys off like first minute. I think his thing, because I spoke to Kites, one of his things was to smash someone early um, to let him know they were there. And he'd elbowed one of our John Nurse off the ball like straight away. Um, and I remember going near him, he's like probably two footed, done me like proper hard. And probably like, just dragged me out, like get up and out, but he'd probably done me in that. But I just thought that was a proper non league player, like 100% like in, and he wouldn't let you have like a yard, he'd be on you straight away. I enjoyed playing professionally at Shrewsbury and stuff, but obviously the facilities compared to 
going down to non-league is it's a big difference. It's not, it's not, it's not nice, um, especially training Tuesday and Thursday nights. It's, it's, and when it's snowing and freezing cold, it's, it's not the best place to be. In, but um, you had to deal with it, really. I actually enjoyed it. It was, it was a wake-up call, but at the same time, I enjoyed it. And I, um, I don't think I'd be where I am now if it wasn't for that. For many players who drop down to non-league, playing part-time football isn't enough to pay the bills. As well as training and playing, they have to supplement their earnings with a regular job. The monotony of plodding along provides the perfect fillet for a football career heading for the scrap heap. Obviously, I worked on a building site. There was 15 blokes in my gang, so it was the same as pretty much being in the change room. So the, the banter and all that was still there, everything was... But with football, it's a little bit different. It was something that I've always wanted to do. I was getting up at six, going to work. Well, it was hard graft. It's, it's not easy then going to training, your midweek games, etc., etc. It was hard. You always think to yourself, right, I'm not going back to that. And that, that is the driving force, and that, that was the driving force behind me to to make me get to where I am now. And I respect everybody that goes and, and plays non-league and works full-time every week because I know how hard it is. Being non-league, you train two times a week, Tuesday, Thursday, play a game on a Saturday. I was getting paid uh, non-league, to be honest, um, because I had a decent-ish team. Um, so I was getting a little bit of change there and then doing my lifeguarding while I was, while I was um, doing my college work. So, but I, I feel, because I've done that, I cherish every moment of that as I'm as a footballer because being a lifeguard is so boring. I hate every single minute of it. And now I'm being paid for a job that I love to do and I would do for free. One of my mates, Doggy Keen, his dad owned a hitching train station up the sweet shop there. So I worked like five, six hours a week. I think it was five pound an hour um, to get my train back to Kent, which was like 20 quid um, on the weekend. While the academy system discarded these raw talents, a number of non-league teams gained an unpolished gem that helped transform the fortunes and profile of their club. The non-league battleground didn't dilute their talent, it gave them a platform to showcase their skills. Uh, Jamie Vardy, obviously a non-league player, um, at the time playing for Fleetwood Town. I got to know about him playing for Stocksbridge Steels some years before that. Um, and he eventually was became the first million pound player to be transferred from a non-league club to a, to a football league club. I think everybody recognises his pace, but also his uh, passion and desire to actually get to that ball before the, uh, before the centre back. So when you play balls down the side, to ordinary players, they'd be balls that the centre back would mop up. When you played that ball to Jamie, he knew straight away he was in a fight for the ball and had to either put it out of play or sometimes didn't actually make it. And Jamie actually got a one-on-one -on -one situation in, and on occasion played other people in, but also he was able to score himself. Uh, you don't build up your hopes until um, you, uh, you realise that maybe you do have um, somebody a bit special. And I can remember the first ball that was pinged at, uh, at Charlie. Uh, uh, he killed it stone dead, um, he dropped his shoulder and created the space to knock a lovely ball out to the wing, then ran into the penalty area and uh, I was stood next to Tom Killick, a manager, and I, I, I nudged him and I said, hey, you see that? We've got a Blair. Uh, he scored 46 goals in the 46 league games that season. Uh, you know, he was, uh, he was, he was special uh, game after game after game. pre-season and we was training and I thought so, oh, I'll have a look at him and anyway I got talking to him and I took him from the, the, the third team to the, I put him straight in the first team because he was that, that good and in the, that, the first game he played he scored two goals. I couldn't believe really how, how people didn't take any notice of him. Naturally gifted and athletic Many of non-league's famous alumni had the talent to make it, but lacked the drive and application, until an epiphany prompted a dramatic turnaround in attitude. Yeah, when I was playing at Hinkley, non-league, I wasn't working now, so um, it was just a case of trying to get my head down and do things off the field. Obviously, playing part-time, a lot of people have got full-time jobs and careers, so um, I knew that um, a bit more hard work, I could be that one step ahead and manage to get back into full-time football. and then. Um, the best thing that probably happened was moving to Luton and um, moving out of the area I was from and just getting away from all Rampton. 
could concentrate more on, on my football then and um, don't have to worry about all the things going on around me and around the people around me. So. The number of players who've gone on to play in the professional game that I've worked with with England C, uh, and I'm you know just with England C is is in excess of 250 players now. There's just some great inspirational stories about non-league players. I mean, I can remember working with a lad called DJ Campbell. And DJ was a real character. And I took him to see a colleague of mine um, who was heavily into sports conditioning. And I remember we t I drove the boy, DJ, to meet this guy in Leicester. And within an hour of being there, DJ was strapped up with this, with this holster and this sleigh that you could stack weights on and he was running up and down this field and uh, DJ actually said could he take it home with him and I can remember he was sticking it in the back of the car and he was training for hours and hours you know as a, as a young boy dragging this sleigh around you know because he was determined to, to, to make it. After years of setbacks and disappointment when their dreams had all but disappeared the forgotten men of non-league finally got their lucky break a move to a football league club, and they made it count. Bournemouth Pop is at home. I've just come off a week trial at Swindon whilst playing for Pool Town. Uh, I didn't know at the time that Danny Wilson had come to watch the first half. He didn't tell nobody that he was coming, and I'd scored two in the first 20 minutes. I played okay, it was lashing down, and, and that was it really. I never, I thought oh, it was just a, just a normal game, we won 4-2. The next day I get a phone call from, from Danny Wilson saying, hi Charlie, I was at your game last night, and I was like, wow, he said, but I left at half time, you'd scored two, I, I know the result, and look, we're going to speak to Paul Town and try and get a, a deal done, so I want to offer you a contract, is that something you're interested in? And I was over the moon, I, at first I thought it was a little bit of a wind up, but then I thought, wow, the phone went down, called my dad straight away, and that was it, I just thought, right, I've been given a chance now, I, I signed a nine month contract for Swindon, and I thought, right, I'm going to grab this opportunity with both hands, and and get given another one. Once I got in through the door when I was at Reading, that's when I put my work in. I went out early, did my finishing, my crossing, because technically I wasn't the best coming from non-league. Um, and then I worked doubly hard when it came to shape and formation and stuff like that, because you don't learn that stuff at non-league. Um, and I'm not a person, I'm a person where if I'm struggling with something, I don't feel embarrassed to ask questions. I will go to I'll go to them. And go, Nadi, I understand that. Can you explain that to me? Sometimes people go, Oh, I'll be like, but I want to get it for myself because you're not living my life. You're not you're not doing my career. So I want to make sure I understand it before I I start anything. And that's the best way. What a rags to riches story about Cohen Bramall, Arsenal's latest recruit as a left back, Brian McDermott was it a game where this boy played and straight away he um, phoned Arson and Arson said, well, bring the boy in. So they brought the boy in on the Monday and he was expecting to train with the youth team <laughs> or with the under-23s and Arson called him over and he trained with the first team, which was unbelievable. Must have impressed him because he offered him a contract and. The unbelievable thing was the week before he got the sack from his job, so he was unemployed. Being the top dog in non-league means nothing once you've made the step up to the professional game. A swift rise through the football pyramid comes with a swift rise in standard. It can be a shock to the system that only the best survive. The key difference is technique in every single league. Technique from non-league to league two to league one to championship to the Premier League. There could be a player in the Premier League who's as strong as a player in the in League Two. There could be a player as quick as someone in the Premier League as there's someone in some non-league. There could be a player that can jump as high as someone in the Premier League that is someone in non-league. But it's technique that makes you better. It's the technique that's the difference between every league in football. I learned quite a lot when Kevin Phillips came to work for us when we were at Leicester, because obviously he's a prolific, he was a prolific striker and uh, has wonderful technique and, uh, and, and worked with our strikers and did a very, very good job and probably made Jamie a better striker than, than he was previously um, because if you, you're taking advice of somebody who's been there and done it, which Kevin had, then it's bound to rub off 
and I think some of it goes down to the fact that, that Kevin persevered. And I think Kevin got frustrated at times with Jamie because Jamie would uh, try and lash everything. And, uh, and Kevin's advice was, I passed a lot of my goals into the, into the goals. I actually passed it in. I didn't have to smash it. There are times when you have to, but I, I, I scored most of my goals, or a lot of my goals, by just being clever and timing that, that, that shot or that pass into the goals. And I think Jamie benefited from that, if I'm being honest. Quite a few players slip through that net. So, but because you don't make it into an academy, don't mean you can, can't make it as a professional footballer. Like I said, you only have to look at Jamie Vardy and Mikel. Mikel does have work rate. Like, listen, he's not the best player in the world, but he does have work rate. For me, every player should have that trait about them. Not everybody has it. Um, I think with kids in academy, they're not taught that. Um, I, to be honest, I don't think you can teach it to a degree. It comes from inside. It's if you work hard, your rewards are better. I remember going to Brentford and um, it was the start of pre-season and we went there and um, we went to Florida and I couldn't keep up. Like, and, uh, like it was a big shock, just the, the level of fitness and intensity and quality of training. It was a big shock, but um, I felt like I learned a lot in a short space of time. I never wanted to go back to the building site when I got given that opportunity, so I needed to work really hard to, to take it with both hands, which I did. Um, but in the back of my mind, for, year, for the first two, three years, I thought, oh, I need to work harder, I need to work harder. Swindon, I need to be better, I need to be better. Burnley, I need to be better. Still, that opportunity, I may, I may go back. But lucky enough, I just worked hard as I could with Eddie Howe, Danny Wilson, and, and, and fortunate enough, I got my move to QPR. And that's when I really thought, do you know what, I'm not this ex-builder no more. But, but I've not forgot where I've come from. I'm not this ex-builder no more. I'm Charlie the footballer. I'm going to work as hard as I can to get in that Premier League now. The journey to the Premier League via rejection, self-doubt, a non-league outpost and the Football League is the stuff of schoolboy dreams. But there's no room for sentiment. Players who make their mark arrive with a bang rather than a thank you for having me. It, Man City at home for QPR was one of the best games I've played. It was unbelievable. Um, I had so many chances in the game. It was like me versus Hart. It was save after save. But then I've timed my run perfectly. Mauricio is just slipped me the ball in. I didn't I had my first touch. I had another touch. But at one point, I never once lifted my head up, going back to the point of knowing where the goal is all the time. And I just slipped it past Joe. And the second half, I, I put a great cross in and Di McKay scored an own goal. And that was the point where I think I really put myself out on the map. That look, I am here as a Premier League player, I am here to score goals and I can put in big performances. Again, that's where Roy Hodgson watched. Yeah, we played Chelsea away and I do a chop, I'm quite good at Croy for a chop, I did it on Ashley Cole and usually in the lower leagues I was, I was gone, I was through on goal, but Ashley Cole straight back there, I was like, whoa, like, now I'm in the big league because he literally, he was, he was right there straight away. So I think that was the moment I knew um, I'd have to improve even more. Well, if you look at someone like Jamie Vardy, who's the modern day pin-up boy for non-league transferring into you know, the, the Premier League, I know he, when Leicester signed him in 2013 that he was there in a the championship, but he had the same attributes when he played for Stockbridge, when he played for SC Halifax and when he played for Fleetwood. He had the same, quality, the same attributes and the same qualities, he had the pace and he had the hunger. The Jamie Vardy that you saw last season chasing defend, harassing defences, not giving centre halves a minute, not giving full backs a second. You know, he's all over the back four. For a small lad, he put himself in there as well. He lived on the on the edge a little bit as well, and I think managers like that. It's hard to describe. I think we had um, Swansea at home at the first game, so um, <clears throat> I don't think it was until the next game against Liverpool where it really sank in. I think. Um, Obviously playing at home and stuff, is, I was used to it from the season before. So when um, so we played Liverpool the week after where you, you see the team sheet coming and realise what you got to have to play against now every week. And it was, that was the first time I got my goal as well. I don't know how to explain it, especially how, we, how, I, how I scored the goal and it put us 2 up against, against Liverpool. It was um, a massive day for me. And um, yeah, I can't, words can't really describe that for me. In the first season, obviously you see all these stars and think, do I belong here? But I think the more you play and the more confidence you get playing with these players and feel that you belong at that level, you, the second season was much better for me personally. I just felt I belong here. In an era when the financial gulf between the Premier League and the rest is ever widening, making it from non-league to the top flight seems improbable. It goes against everything the academy system has set up to achieve. 
yet it happens, and with surprising regularity. As the top clubs stockpile talent from around the world, homegrown players are either slipping through the net or finding it increasingly difficult to break through. They seek salvation in the non-league wilderness. Here, they turn into men, which gives them an edge, that raw non-league X factor. I love the non-league players because they're young, they're hungry, they want to listen, they want to learn. Um, they just want a chance in life, you know. A non-league are full of triers. They give 150%. Yeah, I mean, I always tell people now just the best thing to do was, well, for me, release, get down there, play football games. Obviously, the academy players, they're playing academy football, but if you can play proper men's football straight away, I think I was like 17 to 21 before I went into the football league. That's a great experience for me. I'd rather have done that than play like the under 21s and under 23s now. Um, Learn so much more and I'd advise anyone to do that. Everyone's seen players who are supposed to be the next best thing that don't ever fulfil their potential. And um, I don't know if that's because they get <clears throat> the money so young, you know, they don't tend to appreciate it or they just haven't got the right mentality and it just it affects them and um, they're just, just happy to be where they are. There are, there are a lot of players that, that do drop down from academies and, and come down into non-league football, but there are also a lot of those players that don't get the move back up. Now, if you look at someone like Andre Gray, Andre Gray has a fantastic reputation as a goal scorer, but he was also a guy who could miss a lot of chances too, but he wouldn't let that get to him. He probably missed four or five easy chances before he knocked in a screamer from 30 yards. He was that kind of player, he, he just kept, he kept on going, a little bit like Charlie Austin too. So these guys, they just keep on going and going. They don't really let the, the, you know, the chances, you know, the missed chances get them down. And I think that's a, that's a real key attribute of the non-league football, that they just keep on going. The likes of Jamie Vardy, Charlie Austin and Mikel Antonio have shown there is always hope. When all else seemed lost, they persevered and reached the top of the game after initial failure. There are more rough diamonds outside the league waiting to be found. As a lot of footballers, you, you, you buy, you know, star players and all that, and all they're interested in is the money. They've not got the hunger or the desire anymore. So that's why I love getting non-league players. And we've got another one. We've just bought a, a little lad from St Albans, Junior Marias. What's that name? He'll be the next one on the block, coming from non-league, <laughs> making a lot of noises. People took the piss out of me all the time, trying to go cheap non-league players, but they're not cheap. <laughs> but I had the last laugh. Ready-made players for me, you've got to look at the likes of Sean Raggett of Lincoln City now. I've watched him since he was, he was at Dover. He's got so much technical ability for a centre-half. He'll get better and better for sure. People like Ian Wright didn't come through until he was in, in his later stages. So. Just because you're not under 23 doesn't mean to say you're not going to make it because there'll be lots more Jamie Vardy's on the horizon. Um, I think you've seen the, probably the boys you've interviewed now that they've, they've shown the, the path and what can be possible. Um, obviously, you'd say Jamie Vardy's the, the biggest example of it, um, scoring the, how many goals he did last season, playing for England and winning the Premier League. I think it just proves that... Um, players can come from non-league and do it and I think you're seeing that a lot more often now. Just never give up because uh, if you're good enough some, someone's got to spot you. So many, I think only two of our team got taken on in the YTS and so easy just to filter out. Like there's, I think there's hardly any of them playing actual football now so if, if you just keep strong and keep believing um, and obviously work hard then you'll get spotted because it's so easy to fall out of the game um, after a knockback like that but um, just keep believing. I remember just doing interview after interview for the first time the ex non-league football, the builder, brick by brick, etc. all of the kind of stuff. And it wasn't until I got the move to QPR, I remember speaking to Paul Morrissey, the media guy, and just saying, I don't mind doing interviews, but can we stop, can we stop the non-league and the builder side? Because I feel like I've, look, I've scored 18 goals in the Premier League, I'm a Premier League goal scorer. I, I, as much as I've not forgotten about any of that, it's all about me now and Charlie the footballer. <laughs>